All right, guys, it says a 47-year-old man presents to the emergency room with fever, mild right upper extremity weakness, headache, neck stiffness, and photophobia. On exam, he has positive Brzezinski's and a blurring of the disc margins on fundoscopic exam. What is the next step in the patient's care? Is it A, head CT, B, ceftriaxone and vancomycin, <clears throat> C, ceftriaxone and vancomycin and steroids? And then there's a second question that'll say, Given the patient's age, what is the most likely organism responsible for this diagnosis? Is it A, group B strep? Is it B, strep pneumonia? Or is it C, Neisseria meningitidis? Uh, okay, so obviously here's a good question that's going to, you know, the, what's the learning point on this? And it's going to be what? You, when, it's very clear that we're looking at uh, meningitis, okay? Meningitis. So, we're going to kind of, kind of go over this today about kind of the, the biggest pieces. Now, I've been making those those short videos, and there should be a, you know, infectious disease short uh, short video playlist that'll kind of hit on all these topics. But again, out us, whenever we learn a topic for the step exams, learn how to tell a story. And that's what we're going to do for uh, meningitis, okay? So here is how I would do this or how, how I would learn it. So we know that... You know, just based on those symptoms alone, right? The person had fever. They had uh, neck stiffness. Okay, so all, you're, you're, you're leaning toward this, okay? Altered mental status. Uh, the, you know, again, that's just, that's kind of a general term, but altered mental, mental status, you know, are they are they oriented? You know, they, do they know time, place, date, et cetera, all that kind of good stuff. And then, Obviously, this the photophobia is kind of one of those path mnemonic, almost like a giveaway to it. You you got to be all over uh, menin. I almost can't spell this right. Meningitis. But here's the deal, right now on the step exam. Th hopefully, they'll give you all three of these. But classically, only and you don't have to know this as far as percents. Only forty three percent typically have all three of the symptoms. Typically, it's, it's only going to be one. So meningitis has always got to be in your differential. Now on these step exams, they want to know that it's on your differential because essentially these these exams are the minimum standard to make sure you basically don't kill somebody uh, should you get licensed or get into residency and, and all that kind of good stuff. So <clears throat> we got to be thinking meningitis whenever there's fever, neck stiffness, some type of altered mental status, and of course you can throw in the, um, the photophobia. So in uh, babies, okay, you know, obviously infants, babies, you're going to have that fever, irritability, and then uh, lethargy, right? Just don't want to move, don't want to get up, don't want to do anything. And then, and then adults, you're obviously thinking, like we just talked about, fever, the signs and symptoms, they, they present to the emergency room with fever, headache, uh, again, neck stiffness, and then sensitivity to light, uh, you know, photophobia. All right. So then here's where the where you start the learning points come in to where they're going to hit you on the exams is what causes this, right? What, what's the, the basis behind meningitis? And there's several things. It could be it could be viral, right? It could be bacterial, and that's the one they're going to want to test you on because that's the one that could potentially kind of kill you. And then uh, you could have like fungi, uh, parasites, and then there's kind of a unspecified meaning. Sometimes they just don't they just don't know, or it, it, it's kind of out there in left field. Okay, so viral, bacterial, fungi, and, un, and kind of an unspecified category. So again, we're talking about meningitis, right? Someone who presents to the ER with fever, headaches, neck stiffness, photophobia. You better be thinking meningitis. They're going to test you perhaps on mechanism, the, you know, obviously the cause, and then the treatments. Okay, that's the key piece. So. When it comes to the viral, right, that's going to be the majority. And if we just were to stick some percents, and you don't need to know the percents, you just got to be kind of aware of, of you know, what the common ones are, is viral is going to be roughly 55% of the cases. Bacterial, 22%. You know, this fungi category 7, and then this unspecified, heck, we don't know, you know, upwards of 17, you know, 17%. So with that being said, if I said viral meningitis, it's, you know, it, it's rarely, rarely fatal, okay? Um, and if you have a good immune system, uh, everything just kind of goes, you know, kind of plays itself out seven to 10 days and you're kind of back in, you know, back in action. 
And now we have this bacterial, okay? Now we have bacterial meningitis. If you don't, you know, if you don't treat this quick and effectively, within hours sometimes, you can have brain damage, okay? Brain damage, you can have hearing loss, this could lead to uh, sepsis, right? And what? And really, what is sepsis? That is just your body's your body's extreme response, uh, you know, basically to infection. Okay. But the the deal is, if you don't treat bacterial meningitis quickly and effectively, you could have brain damage, you could have hearing loss, you could have some type of neurological deficit uh, that's permanent, and obviously that's frowned upon. So. Uh, what are we talking about again? Meningitis. What does it look like? Fever, headaches, neck, neck stiffness, photophobia. What are the main causes? Well, it could be viral, bacterial, fungi, or unspecified. Viral is most common, but rarely fatal. Bacterial is the one they're going to test us on, so we better know it because it can lead to brain damage, hearing loss, um, which could lead to, you know, obviously, obviously could also lead to uh, sepsis, etc. So, with that being said, let's just take a, a, a short step back and say, well, what's the, you know, let's just, where are we at here in all this? Well, we're in the meninges, right? Well, what are the meninges? Well, the meninges kind of cover the brain, uh, brain and, and spinal cord. And so if we were in the, the brain, think of it like this, you know, we have the, we have the skull, okay, and I know I'm way over here. We have the skull and then, you know, and then the brain's in here. Okay, we're just say here's the brain. We're gonna give it a nice little thing like that. But between the two, you know, we have this layer called the dura mater. Okay, and we could get into all the uh, embryology, how this, how all the meninges develop, but it's not the purpose of, of this video. So we have the dura, and as we go more inward towards the brain, then we have this space called the arachnoid. Uh, mater, and all these are part of the meninges. Okay, dura mater, arachnoid mater. And then when, when you're in the arachnoid, then we're, we're going to put these blood vessels in here, right? The vein and artery. And then, a little pooch down. And then this last little layer on the most inner part of the meninges is going to be the, the pia mater. Okay, pia mater. Um, M A T R at the end. So we got the dura, the arachnoid, and the pia. And then, so we have to have some type of bug, okay, let's just call it a bug or whatnot, go in here to this area, which is next to the brain, obviously, and it's going to cause some type of inflammation, okay? And you say, well, how does it get there? You know, uh, well, we're going to show that. It can be, it could be one of these, these groups, and then in a second here, I'm going to show you the actual, gonna, or at least I'm going to uh, teach you the exact mechanism behind it, okay? And that's what's going to make you, you know, if I was creating a step one question, I'd go for that mechanism piece. But let's just play the percentages, because again, we're talking about meningitis here. Looks like fever, headache, neck stiffness, photophobia. My most common causes are going to be um, broadly viral, okay? Then it's going to go bacterial, unspecified, and fungi. Viral, rarely fatal. Bacterial, bacterial meningitis issue, that's a problem, because it can cause brain damage, hearing loss, leads to sepsis, um, and sepsis is your body's most extreme, is an extreme response to infection. Where am I at in this whole process? Well, here's the skull, and then I got the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pier mater, and when these guys get inflamed, okay, by something, uh, and I'm teaching in a second, it can cause meningitis. So, if I were to classify the actual organisms, okay, because we even got to what the exam looks like, but if I had the organisms that are associated with meningitis, let's just go my top ones, right? Because almost anything you learn in, in the microbiology realm can cause this. But the organisms that we're going to talk about, are, let's just go based on age, okay? Let's just go, if you, if you go based on age, you're going to be right there in the mix of the, of the big ones. If I'm thinking less than two months, so if you get a question and, the, and it's, an, it's an infant, baby infant, uh, and I forget how the classification of infant on that, but anyways, less than two months, you better be thinking group B, strep okay group b strep and then if i'm thinking greater than two months okay which is well based everybody else for the most part i want you to be thinking strep pneumonia okay and again what are we talking about here we're talking about meningitis we're actually talking about bacterial meningitis at this point we're very focused on the bacterial meningitis what are my top organisms well if the if the 
patient is less than two months, I'm thinking group B strep. If it's greater than two months, I want you zeroing in on strep pneumonia. Now, we're gonna play the exceptions game, okay? Because again, you're telling a story, guys. If you were to say patient walks in, fever, headache, neck stiffness, photophobia, meningitis, and go through all this, and you say, well, and then you'll say, okay, the organisms, what are my top ones? Less than two months, group B strep, greater than two months, think strep pneumonia. But there's always exceptions, right? Between the ages of 11 and 17, I want you to be thinking Neisseria, uh, menin, meningitis, okay? Neisseria meningitis. Uh, and so essentially, okay, this is the one that's what? College dorms, uh, military uh, barracks, you know, close quarters. People, and then, uh, you know, when they go, people go off to school, not necessarily the, the college dorms, but uh, like boarding schools, okay, things like that. Think Neisseria meningitis, okay, but the ages of 11 to 17, most likely uh, organism. And then if it was, say, let's say like a non-vaccinated person, okay, non-vaccinated, I'm not saying ne necessarily immunocompromised, I'm just saying non-vaccinated, uh, I'm not, I shouldn't really just focus on that so much, but anyways, where I'm going with it is, I'm playing the what if game, what if it was, they didn't have the, these vaccines, we could be thinking Haemophilus influenza, okay, Haemophilus influenza. And then if immunocompromised, okay, immunocompromised, you know, HIV, someone who's going through some type of uh, chemo, anything like that, if they're immunocompromised for whatever reason, and it could be pregnant, uh, older adults, basically, I want you to be thinking listeria, okay? And I made some shorts on listeria um, before, uh, but anyways, Listeria immunocompromised, and again, that could be uh, pregnant women, it could be older adults, it could be HIV, anybody going through some uh, chemo, and because they know listeria can cross the placental barrier, okay? Okay, so kind of an issue there. So these are all my organisms. These are the basic. Now, can there are there a ton more that can do it? Yes, but then we're just kind of chasing stuff, right? Because... We're talking bacterial meningitis here, bacterial, group B strep, less than two months, strep pneumonia, most everybody greater than two months, and then there's, then there's these extras. Now, if I were to place percents on this, if I said, well, how, what are the percents of the organisms that create bacterial meningitis? What's the most biggest one? Well, obviously, it's going to be strep pneumonia, because I already said it's greater than two months, most everybody, without the with those exceptions. That's roughly 58%. Don't need to know these percents, okay? You just need to know the kind of a, a general, hey, the most common one is going to be strep pneumonia in that age range. And then, you know, group B is roughly 18%. Neisseria, I think, you know, I was, of course, I researched these for you guys. 14, uh, Haemophilus, influenza, uh, 7%. And then Listeria, you know, way down there at 3%. But when you start adding these up, we're getting close in the 90s, between 90 and 100, right? 60, 80, you know, somewhere in there, 10, 24, uh, Heck, if I don't know, shouldn't, shouldn't add up more than that. But anyways, you know what I'm talking about. This is the majority of the stuff, okay? Majority of the organisms. Now, I don't want to go too deep into that, but group B strep, because they could they could, they could put this question like this. Patient has, they, they present like this. You know it's bacterial meningitis. And they said, what, which is characteristic of the most common organism of someone greater than two months? You know it's strep pneumonia, but that's not going to be an answer choice, right? They're going to put something like, uh, gram uh, positive or, you know, whatever. They're going to describe it in a microbiology-esque way. But anyways, gram positive is strep pneumonia. Um, uh, gram positive is, is group B strep. Neisseria is going to be gram uh, negative. And so you're saying, well, who cares? Well, who cares is, is the treatment. We got to get the right antibiotics to make sure that we're actually covering these guys. Okay. So anyways, Back to the story. Patient presents to the ER a fever, headache, neck stiffness, photophobia. What's on my highest of my differential? Uh, meningitis. What are my top choices? Viral, bacterial, uh, fungi, unspecified, right? What's the one I really care about? I care about bacteria. Why? Because it could lead to permanent damage, if not death. Viral is rarely fatal. So 
The next thing that I would do is you're obviously you're talking to the patient and, and that. So in the in the question stem, they got to give you some clues. They got to direct you a little bit at this point to say what is my next step after talking to this person. The the, the real question is, do I order uh, a CT? Do I order a lumbar puncture? Or do I start antibiotics? And this is the real test that I think they're going to get you on on your step exams is to know which of these do you do is the most appropriate to do next, right? Because this is all just memorization, simple facts, you know, focusing on, on the big stuff. But then do you do a, go ahead and do a CT scan? Do, a, do, do you do a, go ahead and do a lumbar puncture without the CT scan? Or do you just go ahead and do the antibiotics right out of the gate? That's the test question, okay? That's where I would put my focus is understanding this. Now, how do I answer that? Well, the question that really what you're going to do with this is if you have if you have neuro deficits. Well, what is a neuro deficit? Meaning you do like a neuro exam and you got weakness. Um, you know, there's weakness. There's uh, yeah, I guess you can't stress that enough. You could have ultramental status, but that, that, that wouldn't say you jump right to that. You could just, because ultramental status, you wouldn't do a lumbar puncture. You do a CT scan, make sure there's not some issue going on with the brain. But anytime there, time that there is a, uh, a neuro deficit or that there's unstable vitals or recent seizure, you know, anything that's a major problem, like we're seeing major problems you're going to immediately go to antibiotics, okay? And I think we could also throw in coagulation abnormalities, okay? Understand, these are this is different than just confusion, right? You have a neuro deficit. There's weakness. You're four out of five, three out of five on neuro exam. You have unstable vitals. You have recent seizure and coagulation or coagulation abnormalities. That's when you're going to go straight to antibiotics, all right? Now, before we get into the antibiotics, what, what, what would the of more of the exam even look like, okay? What kind of exam? It's going to be limited. You're, you're going to do a neuro exam. But again, to have a good neuro exam, you got to have someone that's, that doesn't have altered mental status, right? Because they got to follow directions. So if someone, you're trying to do a neuro exam and they're confused, but they don't have any of this stuff up here, then you would go do the CT scan before you you did the lumbar puncture, okay? Now, in a perfect world, patients engaging, their, the neuro exam is pretty much unremarkable, and they're able, and they're there, they're present, they have a good mental status exam, you could do the lumbar puncture. If they're confused, uh, or, you, or, you find, or you find one of these other traits, then you do a CT scan first, okay? But again, I can't stress enough. If you have neuro deficits, unstable vitals, recent seizure, coagulation abnormalities, you're going to go straight to antibiotics because time is of the essence. Okay, time is of the essence. And I was reading if you, uh, you know, if you delay treatment even within hours, that it could lead to obviously negative outcome that are permanent. So back to the exam. The things you want to be familiar with are Koenig's test, uh, Rodzinski. And of course, I want you to just that fundoscopic uh, exam. Now, those are the ones that I, I see a lot in, in test questions. So, Koenig's is resistance by the patient, resistance of knee extension with hip flexion. So they're on their back, hips flexed up, and you're 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 trying to say extend the knee, and there's resistance to that. You know, kind of pain. Okay. And then Brzezinski, this is probably the one you'd, you'd see even more so, I think, because it's a, little, a lot simpler. You know, the patient is supine, um, and there's passive you, uh, the physician, you know, they're laying down in the stretcher or whatnot on the bed or the table, and you passively lift their head, okay? So passive flexion of neck, and of course, they're either going to have pain, pain, which is then they're going to bend their knees on the table because they're going to try to relieve that type of pain. So passive flexion of the neck, patient kind of bends the knees, they're in pain. That's a positive Brzezinski. These are, if they're positive, they are suggestive of. They're not diagnostic of, they're suggestive of. You got to be thinking meningitis. Meninges are inflamed. The meninges inflamed. 
Now, fundoscopic exam, the piece you need to know, there's blurred margins, okay? Blurred margins of disc, uh, you gotta be thinking papilledema. And again, that's gonna be a concern that you wouldn't wanna do a lumbar puncture without a CT scan. Why? Because you're gonna, if you have blurred margins, your risk of papilledema, uh, there is a risk of herniation. Okay, risk of herniation if you do a lumbar puncture and stuff like that. So this is what you're going to see kind of uh, the questions are going to embed, uh, the exam piece that are they're going to embed in the questions. And that's going to help you differentiate whether you do a CT scan for, uh, well, the fundoscopic, you do a CT before the lumbar puncture, and then these two are just more suggestive of meningitis. Okay, so with that being said, now let's get back to the antibiotic piece. And again, all you're doing, guys, is telling a story at this point, starting with fever, headaches, neck stiffness, photophobia. You're talking about the major ones, and you're talking about which organisms based on age, with a few exceptions, okay? And then you're going to go over and say, well, on the exam, well, you say, what would I do first, CT, lumbar puncture, antibiotics? Well, you better differentiate antibiotics based on if they have neurodeficits, unstable vitals, recent seizures, coagulation, abnormalities, you treat antibiotics, which is this, okay? This is the main, main piece, uh, treatment. You're going to be thinking uh, ceph trioxone, okay? Ceph trioxone, vancomycin, and they're going to throw in dexamethasone. Now let's understand these, okay? And then they're gonna be a, uh, well, let's add in this or add in that. And the add-ins, we could say, uh, we may add in ampicillin. And there may be some other stuff based on if there's anything more specific, but now we're kind of getting into the weeds, okay? Now, this is, we're just jumping right in. We gotta give them antibiotics right away because time is of the essence. And so, uh, ceftriaxone, I was thinking, why do they like ceftriaxone so much? Because it reaches high bacterial titer in the CSF, okay? In the CSF, and it persists at the site longer than any other beta-lactam antibiotic, right? It, it goes in, gets high concentration rather quickly, and it stays at the site longer than any other beta-lactam. That's why they like ceftriaxone. Now, what they found is, for some reason back in the day, that there were some that they would say were uh, ceftriaxone non-susceptible pneumococcal meningitis. Uh, thing. So what did they do? They added vancomycin for, uh, for that purpose, okay? So that's why they have ceftriaxone with vancomycin right out of the gate, if you suspect. Now, in the meantime, you're still going to, you know, you're still going to obtain, okay, you're still going to obtain CSF. You're still going to obtain CSF. And with that, you're going to get your, uh, excuse me, you're going to get your gram stain. You're going to get your culture. You're going to get your CBC. You're going to, and you're going to check the glucose protein levels. You're going to get all that stuff. And you're still going to do that. But you're going to go ahead and treat first if you have these guys. Why? Because if you don't, it could lead to permanent damage. But you're still going to get these. Now, uh, before I go back to these guys. So we have the ceftriaxone with the vancomycin, hands down. But then you have this dexamethasone. Well, why? Specifically, if they ask you, why did you add dexamethasone? Because of strep pneumonia. Okay. What they found is if you add the dexamethasone, if, if it's a strep pneumonia, which is your best percentage play, so we're going to give this right out of the gate uh, in case it is this, because if you give the dexamethasone, it decreases the chance of hearing loss and decreases the chance of any kind of per permanent neurological issues. Okay? So out of the gate, I'm giving ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and dexamethasone. And then you say, well, when would I give the, uh, you know, why don't I kind of do a little chaser of ampicillin, all right? When, when do I give this? Well, you're going to give the ampicillin if greater than 50 years of age, you know, immunocompromised. Basically, if I suspect, you know, if I suspect the listeria, if I suspect listeria for whatever reason, or if patient's greater than 50 years of age, uh, or immunocompromised, I'm giving the ampicillin, okay? And we already talked about listeria, right? Uh, pregnant, 
pregnant people, older adults, HIV, uh, in again, listeria, you're, you're kind of thinking the cheeses, I believe, right? Um, unpasteurized cheeses, lunch meats, uh, things like that. That's why when I would give the ampicillin. So do I have to give it? Well, let's read the question stem first, right? Are they greater than 50, pregnant, immunocompromised, HIV, anything like that? Then I would add the ampicillin to it. But at the minimum, if I think bacterial, I'm giving those three, period, okay? So back to the, um, so now I give the antibiotics. I get the, the, um, the uh, lumbar puncture. I get the CSF. I send it out, right? I got to wait a few days. I don't want to wait a few days for my treatment because that could lead to a bad outcome. So you could, there's a whole gram stain. That could be a whole separate video on that. Uh, but anyways, this is going to more guide your treatment a little bit more specific. But these guys are broad enough to cover most, you know, gram, the gram positive, gram negative, give you enough coverage to get you out of trouble. And then again, if it was bacterial, uh, if I suspect bacterial meningitis, I'm going to have decreased glucose, increased uh, protein. Uh, so, and that would be more sus uh, suspicious of the uh, bacterial. And sometimes they may, they may ask you that you may have to compare the, uh, the CSF to serum glucose because there's, it's kind of, kind of a proportional, right, depending on what the serum glucose is uh, because, you know, the CSF glucose is um, it's dependent on the blood, clu blood glucose levels. But anyway, so that's really getting into the weeds. Just know that decreased glucose, increased protein, suggestive of bacterial meningitis. All right. And then, you know, there, there's other ways you can, if someone had, uh, there's direct ways to get the meningitis, you know, if it's like sinusitis and if they have surgery. So you got to look out for that too. But again, this is the basics, guys. I don't know how to stress this enough. Tell the story. Person walks in, fever, headache, neck stiffness, photophobia. You better be thinking on your differential, meningitis. What are my top players? Viral, bacterial, fungi, unspecified. Viral, usually resolves on its own. Bacterial, that's the one I got to treat out of the gate. Why? Because if I don't, it leads to brain damage, hearing loss, potential sepsis. Okay? So then I ask myself, okay, I'm talking to the person. Are they, are they with me, right? I'm going to do two things. Do they have an altermental status? And are there neurological deficits or unstable vitals, recent seizures, uh, coagulation abnormalities? If there's, if there's any of these guys right here, I'm treating right away. Antibiotics, ceftriaxone, vancomycin, dexamethasone, okay? If there's anything, you know, more specific, we may add something else, but this will get you, this is where you need to be right now. Now, if there's no neurological deficit, if there's none of this stuff, yet there's, that they're slightly confused, I can't do a good neuro exam, that's where I do a CT before the lumbar puncture. Okay, but when in doubt, treat, okay? When in doubt, treat, err on the side of caution. And then be familiar with Koenig's, Brzezinski's, and the fundoscopic, the blurring of the margins. You're gonna be, you know, the, the, the organism you're gonna do based on age, it's gonna be less than two months, group B, greater than two months, strep pneumonia. The exceptions are between 11 and 17, Neisseria meningitis, and then uh, think Haemophilus influenza. Now, this has went way down because of what? Because of vaccinations, okay? The, the median age actually has moved way up. Uh, and then if it's immunocompromised, uh, think the, the lunch meats, the cheeses, uh, HIV, older adults, pregnant women, think listeria, you're going to add the ampicillin, okay? So with that being said, let's get back to the original question, okay? Our original question. And guys, do those... Uh, you know, do the, the short videos because they're going to just reinforce this. So back here, it says a 47 year old man presents to the emergency room with fever, mild right upper extremity weakness, headache, neck stiffness, photophobia. On exam, he has positive Brzezinski's blurring of the margins in the fundoscopic exam. What is the next best step? Now, we talked about this, right? But so they're confused. So you're thinking CT, but what's, what's, why am I going to treat this person right away? because they have neurological deficits and we don't want these to get any worse. So the fact that he has a neurological deficit, okay, in addition to the fever, all this generic stuff, okay, that, that's just reeking of uh, meningitis, since he's got the neurological weakness, I'm gonna treat right away. Now, so it head CTs, you know, of course I'd like to do it, but it's not gonna do what I'm gonna do next in my next step. So is it ceftriaxone and vancomycin, ceftriaxone and vancomycin and steroids? Well, again, Look at the age range, right? He's 40, they're 47. Uh, so I'm gonna add the steroids. So my answer choice is gonna be C, ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and steroids. And again, we like ceftriaxone 
because it reaches a high bacterial titer and the CSF persists at the site of infection longer than other beta lactams. It covers, covers broadly, okay? And then we add the vancomycin because there are some ceftriaxone and non-susceptible uh, pneumococcal uh, organisms out there. And again, we add the steroids because it's a percentage play. This covers our uh, streptomonia. And there's been, obviously, if you use the steroids, it can decrease the permanence potential of uh, potential of hearing loss or neurological. So the correct answer is going to be ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and steroids. And then given the patient's age, what is the most likely organism? I want you to, for this diagnosis, is it group B, strep pneumonia, or Neisseria? And again, just based on age, right? Group B, less than two months. Strep pneumonia, greater than two months. And then there's the exceptions. If they're between 11 and 17, I want you to think of Neisseria, Listeria. You're thinking like a pregnant woman, uh, you know, some type of immunocompromised. But in this situation, the guy is 47. Nothing else kind of leads me down a, a different road. There's nothing that says he's immunocompromised or anything like that. So the best percentage play is going to be strep pneumonia. Guys, do the short videos. Reinforce this. Tell the story. If you tell the story, you don't have to keep going back and relearning this stuff. You're just going to memorize. You're going to pretend you're, pretend you're teaching me this, okay? All right, guys. Uh, hope it was helpful, and I'll see you in the next video.